Microphone's on now. How about that? We're good to go? All right, so that's it for our introductions. Thank you, Gail. <laughs> so as a way of just introducing to this class, I'm going to start with this 17th century nun's prayer. I think this is not really from the 17th century, uh, but it's delightful all the same. Lord, you know better than I know myself that I'm growing older and one day will be old. Keep me from the fatal habit of thinking I must say something on every subject and on every occasion. Release me from craving to straighten out everybody's affairs. Make me thoughtful but not moody, helpful but not bossy. With my vast store of wisdom, it seems a pity not to use it all. But you know, Lord, that I want a few friends at the end. Keep my mind free from the recital of endless details. Give me wings to get to the point. Seal my lips on my aches and pains. They are increasing and the love of rehearsing them is becoming sweeter as the years go by. I dare not ask for grace enough to enjoy the tales of others' pains, but help me to endure them with patience. I dare not ask for improved memory, but for growing humility and a lessening cocksureness when my memory seems to clash with the memories of others. Teach me the glorious lesson that occasionally I may be mistaken. Keep me reasonable sweet, reasonably sweet. I do not want to be a saint. Some of them are so hard to live with but a sour old person is one of the crowning works of the devil. Give me the ability to see good things in unexpected places and talent in unexpected people, people and give me, O oh Lord, the grace to tell them so. Amen. <laughs> Cynthia and I actually have a framed copy of this at home, and as funny as it is, I think there's actually a lot of truth in it, and many of these themes are going to reemerge one way or another over the course of these three weeks. <laughs> So just a little uh, on my background, uh, although I'm relatively young, I'm 51 for documentation's sake, um, I've actually been interested in the issue of aging uh, as a spiritual reality uh, for most of my life, certainly my whole adult life. I used to work in a retirement home when I was in high school. My first job out of uh, college, I was my 95-year-old grandmother's caregiver. Um, and she was my step-grandmother, and her love of me and welcoming me into her life was a pivotal point uh, in my formation, and caring for her when I became an adult was important to me. Uh, when I got to seminary uh, and was doing my Master's of Divinity in preparation for ministry, every chance I had to select a topic I wanted to focus on for research always had to do with the issue of spirituality and aging. Um, in fact, I wondered, it took me a while to figure out whether to be a priest or not, because I wondered if I ought to be a deacon. Uh, a deacon is one who is ordained to minister particularly to uh, the marginalized and the vulnerable, uh, typically outside of the context of the parish. And I've long held this fantasy of creating a residential community uh, for seniors that's both seniors and non-seniors living together. So rather than sequestering them all uh, in a retirement home, uh, letting families with young children and 95-year-old widows have a shared life together. I still daydream about that, actually, um, but it was such a serious dream coming out of seminary that it delayed ordination for some time. In the end, I thought, well, become a priest and you could still do that, too. <laughs> so this class today, I don't claim to be an authority on the matter. Uh, all you're getting is my experience <laughs> of aging myself, uh, being around aging people, uh, being a priest to aging people, uh, and certainly doing a lot of reading on the topic. Um, I will be um, speaking from a Christian perspective because I'm a Christian priest, uh, but there's nothing about what I'm saying that is exclusively Christian. Uh, I think wisdom is wisdom, truth is truth. The aging condition is universal, uh, and whether it be another religion or just the secular field, um, there is a lot of wisdom out there on what uh, aging is all about. Um, what this class will not be is tips on how to avoid the reality of aging. Uh, you know, this isn't do Sudoku or do Duolingo or all these <laughs> little things. I'm not saying they're bad. That's just not what this class is about at all. Uh, rather, uh, this class is about how do we perceive the reality of aging as God's intention for us, okay? 
Um, the format of the class will be largely lecture-based, uh, but you are welcome to ask a clarifying question or to, you know, to make a point as we go along. But it's largely just me and my young ego wanting to tell you everything I believe and know. Um, <laughs> at the end, we will break into a, just pairs uh, to discuss a, a question or whatever you want to. Uh, we'll do that at the end. Um, for those of you who are watching us online, uh, if you would like copies of these lecture notes, just email me uh, and I will email them to you, okay? And also, for those of you who like references, um, I'm gonna point out three books to you uh, that you might consider if you want to explore this more yourself. The first one is by Richard Rohr. They're all written in your notes here. He has a book called Falling Upward, A Spirituality for the Two Halves of Life. Um, it's a great title, Falling Upward, that deals with very much the fact that uh, this life is divided into two halves, uh, and the second half in some way is falling, but in other deeper ways, it's all about more becoming. Um, a second book is by Ronald Rollheiser called Sacred Fire, A Vision for a Deeper Human and Christian Maturity. Uh, I found this to be a, all these books are very good. I, I especially liked this one. Um, and I can't tell you how much of this lecture is based on these books I've read. I just trust that everything filters in me and whatever is good and worthy sticks uh, and comes out as my own. But I know I've been informed by both of these books. They're, yeah, they're listed on there uh, um, somewhere. Um, and the third book, I've only just started reading it. It's by Margaret Gunther. It's maybe 30 years old or so. Toward Holy Ground, Spiritual Directions for the Second Half of Life. And it's noteworthy to me as I'm reading these various books. Uh, you could just feel that Margaret is writing as a woman and Ronald and Richard are writing as men. That is not a qualitative difference, but you could just feel the difference. Uh, and so if the, even that statement makes sense to you, you might try if you're a woman reading the woman's book. <laughs> not, I don't want to get too far down that trail and get myself in trouble. Uh, they're all good books, they're all wise, and I commend them to your reading. Um, any questions for me at the front end uh, of our series here? All right, then let's open in prayer. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. God, we thank you for these aging lives that you've given us and trust that you are within them and ask that our gathering together here and considering these things would be a place of your spirit's abode, growing in us a deepening perception of you and us and we and you. We pray this in your name. Amen. So I'm going to start out with some problems culturally that we're dealing with as aging people. Uh, the first is, I think it's no secret to any of you, that our particular 21st century American society doesn't actually have much value for aging. <laughs> um, but I want to be careful that we recognize this is not just a problem for those ungrateful younger generations uh, who ought to revere us. We were all formed in this society together. Society as a whole doesn't value aging, which means even when we are ourselves aging people, we often don't value it either. Um, for example, how did you feel about your gray hair arriving or your wrinkles um, or any of these things we associate with aging is we're, we're ashamed of them, we try and hide them. Um, there's just a general disregard for those things that signify aging. Um, but this is not universally true. It's true of the world in which we were raised, uh, but there are other cultures and other places and other times where the exact opposite has been the truth. Um, we have a little... Uh, the, the opposite has been true, uh, that the advent of gray hair is actually a thing of pride. And just imagine what would, that would be like. Just picture if the first time you started noticing your gray hair, you got excited. <laughs> You're like, it's coming, it's coming. Uh, kind of like a boy when he gets his first whiskers or when a girl starts to get developed and she thinks, finally it's come, I'm stepping into that man or woman I've been yearning to be. Imagine if all the signs of aging elicited that same response from you. 
Um, and I think it has been true of other cultures, just not our own. What our culture values is youthful beauty, right? That's a no-brainer. Um, and as the years go by, um, we continue to try and dress younger and younger. Uh, we dye our hair, we get facelifts. Uh, there's just a baseline value that it's better to look youthful and beautiful. Likewise, we really value productivity and efficiency. Um, we like people who could work like this. We like speediness. We like um, production. Like, we just really like things to be efficient and productive. Um, and I would say also, as a culture, one of the values that we're all being grown into is that um, we like entertainment and we like commerce. <laughs> and so rather than us being a society uh, that's fostering uh, wisdom and knowledge and learning or caring for one another and becoming a community and all these things, what we really like to do is watch Netflix. <laughs> and with the pandemic, all the more so, you know, we just watch a lot of television all the time. Um, and likewise, we like to shop. Um, and so that can slow down in later age, but everything culturally is encouraging us. Buy, 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 redo your kitchen, redo your wardrobe, keep entertaining yourself with shopping. Um, and those latter two values um, can be very solitary, and they are certainly unsoul-forming. There's nothing about kind of just perpetual entertainment and acquisition that is actually good for our formation as people. And though there is still kind of lip service given in our culture to the wisdom of the elderly, I'm not really convinced anyone buys it. We, we believe it is a myth, but we don't actually seek it out in one another. And when, you, when I am with the elderly, if I ask them for their wisdom, they go like this. Like, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm certainly not the old person you're looking for. Um, and so even though people talk about, oh, old people are so wise, how many old people think they are, and how many young people are actually asking for their wisdom? Which makes me think the whole thing is a little more mythological than reality. Uh, which isn't to say I don't wish it were more so. I just think, let's be honest and name it for what it is. Um, and I think we are living very isolated lives culturally. I think most healthy aging is greatly fostered um, when we are sharing daily life together. I call it kind of the, the doing dishes together kind of relationship, where it's not just I scheduled an appointment to meet you once a month or even once a week. It's just you're doing the dishes together after dinner and chatting. Um, that kind of daily relationship is what's so necessary uh, for really healthy aging. Um, but the way we're running our culture, we do not have systems in place to foster that. Uh, if you've never been married or if you have been widowed and you're living by yourself, it's a largely solitary experience. Even when you move into a retirement home, my observation is for most people, they're alone. Uh, they sit in their room all day long by themselves, and when they go to meals, um, they can't hear each other because their hearing aids are picking up all the news from the dining room, and they can't remember the name of the person opposite, and they're embarrassed about it, and so it's kind of silent there too. And what could be an opportunity to create a lot of community, when the community is entered into at such a late stage of life, I think the system and our culture is really undermining us to have much potential for it to become rich community. There are exceptions, of course. You know, Gail Drohan will go to, into any setting. <laughs> right, right, right. Uh, she will never stop being a new sorority girl, uh, right? Uh, but she's the exception, and we can't look to Gail and say, be like Gail. Gail's Gail, who she's been becoming her whole life. Most people enter the retirement homes, uh, and it's very solitary. Um, and this is true of all age groups, not just seniors, but we feel it more keenly in our senior years because the effect is more powerful. Part of the problem is, as a society, we're too wealthy, <laughs> which means we simply don't need each other. Um, we could afford to live on our own. Uh, we could afford all our own tools so I don't have to go next door and borrow my tool and in the process have a conversation and hear how their kids are doing and talk. Um, rather than borrow the, uh, the leaf blower more than once, I'll just go buy my own leaf blower. 
so I don't have to trouble him anymore, that I could be independent, and community breaks down. Um, and I find, too, although in the past and in many other cultures, it's simply normative for elders to move into the house of their adult children or for adult children to marry and come of age and move into the family home. In our culture, we don't do that, and by and large, neither generation wants it. <laughs> the, uh, the people my age don't want their parents living with them, and the parents don't want to either. Um, you know, I look at stories of people in the church, and it's no condemnation, um, but it's not working. So what was a normative way for generations to overlap as a society, we aren't fostering, and therefore we don't want it. Um, and what happens in independence, which is a virtue, we end up in isolation, and in isolation, one, wisdom isn't fostered, because most of wisdom, the fostering of wisdom is in relationship. It's when you're washing dishes side by side, uh, an 85-year-old woman with a 35-year-old young mom, uh, and the 35-year-old mom is just stressed out about her kids and anxious, and the 85-year-old mother remembers what it was like. And she might not have wisdom wisdom, like out of the Bible wisdom, but she has at the very least just the testimony of a life of someone who lived through it and survived. And the 35-year-old now has a vision, it's possible, I'll get there too. But also in the midst of talking, the 85-year-old woman intuitively picks up on when she's sharing stories that they're being well received. Like those elements of her story that are appreciated by the younger generation becomes for her an ongoing formation process while she's sorting out the big questions of what is life all about? What do relationships mean? Who am I? All of that stuff is figured out in storytelling. And storytelling happens best when it just happens because you're washing the dishes together rather than when the church puts together a program trying to pair a 15-year-old with a 75-year-old and they sit and stare at each other and think, this isn't working, Jesus. Um, <laughs> and so um, I think we really need just daily relationships and our society is discouraging it at every turn. Um, and then the other challenge we're dealing with as a society is that unlike previous generations, the way technology is shifting so quickly, it means every 10 years, every, all the tools we're using have become out of date. Um, all the systems we all knew how to use don't work anymore, uh, and seniors are getting left out very quickly, and especially as our technology is now about communication and everything is done through our smartphone. Um, if you can't use your smartphone, you legitimately are being kept out of community uh, because more and more every year it's requiring it. But another thing related to that that I've just recently heard, and as soon as I heard it, I thought, this makes all the sense in the world. It used to be, um, before the Industrial Revolution, that in most families, uh, the children were raised to replace their parents, not only within the family system, but also in the vocational system. The cobbler raised his son to be a cobbler. The mother raised her son to be, or her daughter, uh, to be a mother. Um, if you worked on the farm, you're raising them to do what you did with the same technology. Uh, so that even when you become older, even if it's at the point where you're no longer active in the cobbler shop or on the farm, um, you still are part of the family and you know what they're doing and you're a repository of knowledge. Um, what's happening now in our generation is you aren't. <laughs> Those skills that you had developed are not being passed on to your children because they're no longer needed. Now that's not true in terms of relational skills and all that kind of deeper self stuff, but in terms of just vocational stuff, um, it's not the same for the next generation now, which makes seniors um, useless, unwanted, unvalued, not listened to, redundant. You know, use your adjective of choice. And I don't mean to be terribly <laughs> gloomy and dark hearted, but it's simply the reality of the way our culture is now shifting with every generation. And all of this is just leading to an increased isolation. So, in saying all these things, um, I don't want to be a Debbie Downer, uh, but I do want us to be honest and just to be able to name 
Um, this is the world in which we were formed, and we as seniors um, were also formed in it. So it's not just the younger generation who's doing us wrong. We've adopted those values as well. Like I said earlier, we don't want to live with our kids either. <laughs> so, uh, you know, we've all been formed in it together. Um, and these are huge cultural systemic values that we don't have the power to reverse. We can't make American culture different. Uh, but there's simply value in recognizing and naming what's true. Because when you know what you're dealing with, it just gives you clarity. I remember the first time I was in therapy. Um, I was terrified to go into therapy. I was 22 years old, facing this big, scary world, and I didn't know my place in it, and I'm falling apart, and I didn't understand why I was behaving the way I was behaving. And at one point, the therapist named for me that basically, well, Eric, it sounds like in every struggle you're having, the common denominator um, is a sense of inadequacy. And my eyes got huge, and I thought, of course that's what it is. Of course that's the common denominator. As soon as you name it, my soul knows it. That isn't to say suddenly I was done struggling with inadequacy. It just helps to know who the enemy is, uh, to develop skills and intentions about how am I going to respond to this. So in the same way, if we are living in a culture that in all these ways says seniors and aging are not of value, it's helpful to know what that adversary is, particularly as we're trying to make choices and intentions of how then will I live? I can't stop culture from being what it's going to be, but I can be clearer on what I'm after and what I'm seeking and why I'm seeking it. Any questions, thoughts, opinions? Marilyn? For those of you online, what Marilyn was saying is, if this is all true, then it really seems that the onus is on us to make choices ourselves uh, to combat that, to use a strong word, but to make very deliberate choices about how saying, if this is the world I'm living in, I will live this way. And I think that's exactly what this class is about, um, and clarifying this is the world we're living in, um, and what are ways that I am choosing um, to live in, Counterculturally, um, you know, aging's always you know a challenge, whatever culture in ours just has some particularly isolating forces. Um, and my thesis is that isolation is a real problem um, in aging well. Um, we'll talk more about that. So I've given you the gloomy side, uh, and now I want to do <laughs> is shift to um, an alternative premise uh, about what this season of life is. And the first one, and if you get nothing else out of today's lecture or any of these lectures, it's this, that aging is holy. That the aging process itself is a sacred, holy thing. Um, and that's an absolute contrary message to what our society is telling us. And the rationale for me on why I believe this is so is because God made it this way. All of creation is in transition. Everything is aging. Um, it is a universal pattern for every living thing, um, that it is in a constant state of change. And the basic arc is it is born, it is nourished, it strengthens, it matures, it stabilizes, it declines, and eventually falls. You know, on the tree, we see it each season with the leaves. You know, right now we're watching all the new leaves come out. Every fall, we watch the leaves fall down. Uh, and that, that's just a mini version of the entire life cycle of the tree. Every living thing does this. And we know from cosmology that the earth is designed to function this way. That there is no matter that is not recycled matter. Uh, the tree comes from the mulch which comes from the leaves from previous generations. Like, all life is just reconstituted life. Uh, they say the planet itself is just stardust from these cosmic explosions and this, all this matter 
forming together and becoming a planet, and over time, uh, through God's sovereignty, life begins again. Everything is in a process of making this ark, um, so it must be good, because God made it that way. And so this is very much a spiritual perspective, because I believe there's a God who is the source of it all, and I believe that God can be trusted. It isn't that God can be trusted to make everything pleasant. God can be trusted that in everything, God is. And if God is, and we are with that God, then all shall be well. It's like a child who is frightened um, when they want their mother's lap. It's not because the mother's lap is going to make the bad thing go away. It's just in the midst of the bad thing, I'm in my mother's lap. I remember Henry, the first time he was away from us, it was just for an afternoon at his grandparents, and his grandfather called Cynthia, all worked up, and said, talk to Henry on the phone. And, <laughs> and Henry's just sobbing, and Cynthia said, what do we want? And he said, I want you. That's it. He just wanted Cynthia because with Cynthia, he knew he was safe. And I think that's true of all of us. Um, we want God. Uh, whether we are in a stage of health or a stage of decline, if we have God, all shall be well. Um, that's some deep faith. <laughs> I assure you, um, but I truly believe that's the heart of everything, uh, that God is the center, and we are made in God's image, and we are made for God. And so I trust God that if this is the way God chose to make creation, then all shall be well. Um, which means that this whole process of aging must be of worth to God. If all God wanted was us to be perfectly formed creatures, he could have put us in heaven to begin with. Right? <laughs> like, if God's God and if God's making everything, uh, and if all God wants is for us to be in eternal bliss, then why not just this eternal bliss to begin with? But instead, God made us in this always becoming earth uh, that is always this process of living and dying. Um, it must matter. Uh, which also means that there is no portion of the aging experience of life that is of inferior value to God. You know, we tend naturally to prefer the healthy and the generative to the uh, unhealthy and declining. You know, our reptilian brains um, have built in us avoid pain and suffering at all costs, right? Everything in us when we're confronted with danger will choose flight or fright right, because we're protecting ourselves from suffering. Uh, but if we step back, if God made us this way, it means that there's actually no part of that process that is inferior to the other or in which God is not unique, equally present. You know, it's built into us. We're hardwired to resist death, right? Try and put your head under water in the swimming pool and stay there till you're dead. You can't do it. Like, your body will take over. We resist death. Uh, and so culture and the Bible and us agreeing have all recognized that, you know, death is the enemy. Uh, there's a place in scripture, you know, that spells it out that way. And yet, as I continue to come alongside dying people in my profession, um, I've come to recognize that, yes, yes, death is the enemy until it is not. You know, that God is in the growing season God is in the declining season. God is in the dying season. God is everywhere, each in its season, and we're called to live fully into the season of life we're in. Um, and although there might be more sorrow in later years, it is the right place for you. Uh, someone said to me after church on Sunday in the context of another discussion, God doesn't make mistakes. God does not make mistakes. And what she meant by that well, I'm not going to tell you what she meant by that. <laughs> um, but a presumption to it was that kind of any bad thing is not a place of God's intention. Uh, and I remember I just kind of scratched my head at that, and I thought, you're interpreting that as a mistake, so it can't be attributed to God. But that same thing might not be a mistake. It just might be some suffering, or it might be a place where change is required, and God will be in that place of change. Um, who says God prefers the beginning or the outcome any more than the transition point. And again, I'm just rehearsing this theme that if the whole life cycle is good, 
then God is in it all equally, and our call is to live into the moment fully present uh, with the belief that God is there too, and that what I'm experiencing now is where I'm experiencing God now. Um, And as for avoiding pain, uh, it is natural to do so. Uh, There is no shame in wanting to avoid it. Um, But we also know that suffering tends to be the most formative moment of life. Uh, All of us could think of moments in our life where we were undergoing significant suffering, and in hindsight, we could recognize that's when I made my big steps forward in terms of my own formation. Um, You know, I know many of your stories here, uh, and I could picture coming alongside you at Seasons of Life and know uh, that those were the most formative times. Um, And I simply have to trust God in that. When I was a young father, um, I knew my children needed to suffer, in order to be well-formed, but I also knew that I will always do everything I can to protect them. And I remember just kind of making a deal with God, saying, God, I'm going to do everything to give my children a comfortable, secure life, and I'm going to trust you to handle their suffering, because I don't have the wisdom for that. (laughs) So that one's on you, and I'm just going to seek their stability and comfort and love. Um, And I think we could say the truth just as we're pursuing our own lives. Like, of course, we're going to pursue health and comfort and generativity and all these good things. Um, But it also is helpful if we say, and God, when that doesn't happen, um, I'm just trusting you're handling it from there. Um, The other thing I've been thinking about lately is the incarnation. If you're familiar with that term, that's what we use to describe Uh, Jesus uh, as the divine one, when he took on human flesh, we call that the incarnation. And there's all sorts of theology you could say about the incarnation, but one for this lecture that I want to point out is that in becoming the fully divine, fully human one, Jesus participated in every aspect of our human experience from birth to death. Um, You know, God, let's just fantasize, the Messiah who saved us all from our sins could have come riding in on Pegasus at that moment, done whatever ferocious battle he needed to do to conquer Satan and all his demons, saved all his people, and taken us off to heaven. Like, there's all sorts of mythology that has that kind of picture of a saving God. In the Christian tradition, what we have is a story of God taking on the entire arc of the human experience beginning with Mary um, when she becomes miraculously pregnant. Like, God, uh, and even if you don't think it was miraculous, we still think Jesus had this womb experience. He, it was one cell dividing into two cells, dividing into four cells. Um, Jesus went from there to being raised, to having a successful career, to then knowing what it's like to be misunderstood, what it's like to be abandoned, what it's like to be falsely accused of something uh, and to suffer death uh, and a serious experience of abandonment even from God at the end. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Uh, And he gets put in the grave. Um, So if Christ is the divine one and we take the incarnation seriously, there is a sense in which the entire arc of the human experience becomes sanctified when God participates in it, which again rehearses just the same idea that there is no part of this human experience in which God is not, and in which God is saying, this is now what I have for you, and I will be with you in it. Um, Which brings us to the whole purpose of this class, uh, the spirituality of aging. How do we perceive ourselves as aging people as an actual spiritual experience which is intended uh, by God for us to experience. So, any questions or comments there? All right, so that is my uh, first premise, that the aging process itself is holy and sacred and therefore good. My second premise uh, is that life is largely divided in two halves. Um, This is a pretty universal um, piece of insight, both in the secular world and the theological world, um, that the whole way we perceive our lives is in this first half, 
second half concept. So the first half is all about the ego, the I. Uh, it's very solitary, it's about me. Um, at that age, as we're coming of age in this first half of life, um, we have this sense of endless potential, especially for us who are raised in a privileged, wealthy society. Um, someone's phone going off here. <laughs> we'll pause for the sake of hearing aids. <laughs> for those of us who are raised with some degree of comfort and stability in college education, you know, as you're coming of age, the whole world is your possibility. You could have any job, you could have any wife, <laughs> you could have any, you could live in any location, you could drive any car. I think as we're coming of age in this first half of life, it's characterized by this limitless possibility. Uh, and it is also a season of building up and gathering in. Um, you're bringing it all into yourself. Um, you're gaining new possessions. I remember what it was like being a newlywed with our first house and going to flea markets and, you know, buying a bedside table. Do you remember how thrilling that was? It didn't matter how valuable it was. It was just so exciting to be married and to be making a home and finding these things that are going to become our home. You're starting a new job. Henry just started his first job a week ago, and he's thrilled, thrilled. Like, it's all he wants to talk about, and I don't blame him. Uh, you know, and what he's doing at work and the way they're treating him at work, it feels fabulous to him, as it should. You know, you're at this age of gr building yourself up, learning your professional vocational skill set. You're exploring in relationships. You have your first kiss, your first boyfriend or girlfriend, all these things. You're building your reputation. Uh, how am I perceived? Do my colleagues respect me? Does she think I'm cute? All this kind of stuff. It is a season for getting kind of your sense of self. Um, and my suspicion is that what all this gathering unto yourself is doing, it's really a response to a fundamental question of, will I be safe and secure in this life to come? Is there for me a future and a hope? Because all this sense of gathering unto yourself, it's seeking stability for your place in the world. You know, you've, you've grown up in your parents' home, you're differentiating from them, you're launching out there, and it's totally exciting, uh, but also a little terrifying, but in a good sense. Uh, and all the answers to these questions are you're trying to assure yourself, yes, I belong. Yes, there's a place for me. Yes, I will be safe. Um, and so we tend to fixate often on some pretty immature things. Am I good looking? <laughs> Am I smart enough? Am I likable? You know, because the answer to all these questions is, if the answer is yes, then I will be secure. I will not be alone. I will have a place. Um, and, and along the way, this world is also a rather intimidating, frightening place. Uh, the world isn't necessarily looking to take care of you. Uh, so as you are maturing into this world, you're also developing a whole bunch of coping mechanisms to help you survive, okay? Um, I know for me, in elementary school, one of my coping mechanisms was my reputation as the smart boy. I was no good at sports. I was humiliated on the playing field. Uh, but thanks be to God, recess would end and I would get in a classroom and I was the smartest boy. Uh, so in the face of that fear, I don't fit in, I'm not a good enough boy, in the classroom, that got balanced out, and so I claimed that identity. Uh, it was a coping mechanism to help me survive because I wasn't sure I fit in or that I would be safe or secure. By the time I got to middle school and high school, I was no longer the smartest one, so I put that aside, and then I was the popular one. <laughs> I was class president every year, basically, uh, and I made sure my wardrobe was fabulous because I was pretty vain, and that's really never stopped. Um, <laughs> but I understand it more now. Uh, but looking back, it was just a coping mechanism. You know, I've lost my stability as the smartest kid in the class. Um, the future for me is no longer a world where I could walk confidently into that, so I am gonna be the popular one. Uh, I'm gonna be funny, and by gosh, people are gonna like me. Um, it's a coping mechanism, which is absolutely fine. It's, 
age-appropriate behavior. Cynthia and I always used that phrase with our kids growing up when they behaved in a certain way to say, well, it might be a little annoying, but it's age-appropriate. You know, there's no shame in a two-year-old acting like a two-year-old. You know, it's a problem when they're an eight-year-old acting like a two-year-old. Um, but if at an early developmental stage, we're just gathering unto ourselves all these things to make us secure, that is simply coping me mechanisms that we will have a place in this world. Um, there are also some pretty unhealthy coping mechanisms. Most of the addictions, <laughs> alcohol, drugs, pornography, all those things, um, although they are hurtful to our soul, they do something for us and there's a reason we do it. Um, in a sense, we perceive them as our friend uh, because we are vulnerable uh, and this thing is helping to balance out my vulnerability. Uh, and so we turn to these things because we trust them. Um, I, uh, my spiritual director told me this once, and as soon as she said it, I thought, I believe that's true. She said, Eric, everyone's just doing the best job they can, which doesn't mean they are doing a good job. <laughs> uh, but at any given moment, if you've suddenly had a fight with your wife, you're, the state of your marriage is insecure, you don't know where the future is leading, and you feel bad about yourself as a husband, but by God, that wine sure tastes good, uh, you've learned that it's a good place to go. And even if you know you're an alcoholic and you're afraid to admit it, it's a coping mechanism because in that moment, given the choice of facing the morass of this relational difficulty or a glass of wine, you're just trying to cope. And so you take the wine. It's not good, but it's understandable. Everyone's doing the best job they can. But what all these things suggest, all these ways of kind of gathering ourselves and building up ourselves, is there is in it an inherent existential sense of loneliness. Uh, and I think that is true for most of us in this first half of life. Uh, most of these things we're trying to secure for ourselves is to protect ourselves or free ourselves from what we perceive and feel intuitively is, I am so alone. Even those of us who are raised in healthy homes with good parents, how many of you have memories of being misunderstood, of being by yourself, um, of being the only one in your family who fill in the blank? Um, that's in a healthy family. We all have this existential sense of aloneness, and I think part of what we're dealing with is responding to that craving we have that we not be alone. Um, what I think is interesting is I look at this pattern for the first half of life, and I look at the, cult, the American culture we live in, and I recognize that our culture seems to value all the first half of life values. Gaining a reputation for yourself, being perpetually beautiful, uh, uh, having a career, uh, gaining possessions. All of these are natural first half of life values, but they've actually become the values for American culture. Um, and I wonder why that is. And I'm not a sociologist. I can't answer the question. A couple theories that come to mind is, one, our country is literally very young. In terms of nation formation, you know, 240 years or whatever we are, that's a pretty young country. We don't have a deep heritage. And when this country was formed, it was with a brand new experimental form of democracy. Um, so this governing structure of our country is also very young, and I wonder uh, if the innate values of our, that constitution, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, those can largely be very selfish <laughs> values. Um, and so there's something in me that thinks, um, hmm, our country seems to be locked in that first half of life um, mentality. Right. Right. So for online folks, uh, the uh, ma what Marilyn was noticing is that even the phenomena of being old 
is fairly new at a cultural level. There's always been exceptional people who lived a great age, but the average age used to be 40 or 50. Um, and at that point, you've grown up, you've partnered off, you had babies, you got them to the, <laughs> to the point where they're self-sustaining, uh, and you did your job. Um, and so as a human species, we are also in a rather new territory of being this old. And of course, again, just like we were saying with technology, now for us, every generation, it's speeding up even more. Um, you know, reaching 100, um, no disrespect, Sylvia, but it's not as exceptional as it used to be. <laughs> you know, it used to be you never heard of anyone, and now they're all over the place, so to speak. Okay, so that's all the first half of life. It's about the ego. It's about endless potential. It's building up and gathering unto yourself. It's developing coping mechanisms. Um, and then there's the second half of life that begins at middle age, roughly around 40. And, and we will look at all of these themes more um, in the, the remaining lectures, um, because this is what this class is about. But what happens in the second half of life is that solitary eye grows to include, or if it's happening well. Um, <laughs> let, me, let me say that we know, all know examples of people who, no, no matter how old they get, they never seem to, to mature particularly well. But if the aging process is working in a normative way, uh, that solitary I ego um, doesn't get lost, it just grows to expand a much deepening sense of the we. That no, I am not only an individual, I am also part of a larger body. Um, it also, if it's happening well, we begin to admit and live into the particularity of our limitations. Um, this is what I am, and this is what I am not. This is what I'm good at, this is what I am not good at. Uh, and you begin to admit to those and to accept them in a healthy way. Um, it also begins a season where as the first part was gathering, 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 uh, the second half is more of letting go uh, and giving away. Uh, this can be choices we are legitimately making. I am choosing to give money to fill in the blank. Uh, or it could be things that are being taken from us. I no longer can go climbing in the Sierras. Um, my butt disappeared and I can't fit a backpack that doesn't hang, or my knees won't handle walking over <laughs> the granite. Like it's, the physical health has been taken from you. So whether it's what you're choosing or what's just happening in the aging process, the second half is learning um, to let go uh, and give away. And letting go will become a huge theme um, later on in this course. Um, it also means recognizing when coping mechanisms are no longer our friends. And I use that word deliberately because for their season, they do function as our friend. Um, when I was in elementary school, I wasn't going to enter into some deep Buddhist cr or Christian wisdom about knowing my place in the wholeness of the cosmos and all my classmates. I was just no good at kickball, but I was really good at spelling. And I just grabbed onto the spelling bit because I felt secure about it. Um, I felt superior to my classmates. So even though it was a legitimate coping mechanism at the moment, by the time I'm 50, um, I should no longer be claiming that as a friend, that to make myself feel good about myself, I have to prove that I'm smarter than Jeff. You know, like it is no longer age appropriate behavior. So that the aging process is helping us to see it for what it is, to say thank you for what you gave me, uh, but I don't need you anymore. Um, and I also believe that if the existential problem we're dealing with in the first half of life is, do I belong in this world? Will I be safe and have a place in this world? Um, again, if this aging process is happening in, the, in a normal, normative way, uh, the increasing answer will be, yes, I do belong here. Um, I was on a retreat oh, about two months ago. Um, I won't get into the details of it, but it was a rather profoundly mystical experience for me. And the, the central motif of the whole thing I experienced on that retreat was, your life is worthy. And it was based on no exceptionality of my own, 
what I contribute to this world or the quality of my relationships or what pretty flowers I make. It was none of that. Uh, it was simply you in your self and the life you are having is worthy. And I can't tell you how much that meant to me. And just because I had that experience, I can't tell you therefore mimic it. Uh, but I can point it out as a testimony that this is what the second half of life should be providing us, <laughs> is a sense that I do matter, I do have worth, um, I belong in this world. I heard a comedian recently, and he was telling a great story about a transgender friend of his. Um, this man is not transgender. Um, and he quoted the friend saying, I don't need you to understand what I'm going through. I just need you to believe that I'm also having a human experience. It's another way of saying the same thing, like the life you are having, it's worthy. Like Paul, you and your Paulness are of utter value because of who you are, the end. <laughs> I think that is the, what we want to grow into, is that sense of um, assuredness that I matter. Um, and where all this is leading to, of course, is death. Uh, it is a taboo subject in our culture. We, no, we are not allowed to talk about it. Uh, even having an aging class um, to say, well, we're going to die, it's almost a violence. No, but I'm coming to this class because I want to keep on living well. Like, shh, don't speak. I notice in retirement homes, if I'm in independent living and right beyond that door is assisted living, not a single residence in the independent living <laughs> wing is willing to admit that the assisted living wing is on the other side of the door because it's too threatening. If you live in assisted living, don't even talk to me about nursing care. <laughs> All right? Uh, it is too threatening, and we can't talk about it. Uh, but we can't talk about this thing that we know is the end, um, that it is leading to a death uh, for all of us. What that means is a mystery. We could observe what it looks like for our loved ones to die, uh, but unless we have some mystical, dream-like experience, we really have nothing tangible to bank on about what the other side is. We have theology, we have hopes and dreams, but all we really know is this side of the grave. Um, what's over there is a mystery. Uh, and I, I don't want to talk too much about um, what is beyond death itself, other than to lay out a foundational hope. Just like the testament of creation is which shows, which convinces me of God's value for the entire life cycle. Um, I could look to the testament of creation to, to give me a model or a symbol of what to hope for in the life to come. You all know what an acorn is, and you all know what dirt is, and you all know what soil is, or uh, water is. We know what each of those three things look like. Uh, but if I were to give you an acorn and some dirt and some soil and say, imagine what's gonna happen when you put these three together, you could not come up with an oak tree. You know, if you know the acorn came from an oak tree, of course, you know what its source is. But the point being, just take those raw elements, put them together, it is impossible for us to conceive. And yet, we have a testament in creation of God showing us what happens when things die, and how they merge together with other things, and they become something that would not exist were it for those original forms, but it becomes something entirely new. Uh, this was my sermon, uh, one of my Easter sermons, about this idea, recognizing in the stories about Jesus' resurrection, there are a lot of signs to suggest that his resurrected body was of a radically different nature than the pre-death body. Um, and those are helpful clues to say there is a life to come. Everything in creation, it's not just an arc like this, but it's doing this. And when we reach the bottom of the ark, it is mingling with other things <laughs> before its new regenerated life, like the acorn with the water and the soil. So whatever our life to be will be, um, I believe it is part of this cycle. I believe we will continue to have our particularity 
<laughs> Here we have a uh, case study of an aging person. In this case, <laughs> it's Augustine, who I think at this point is about two months old. <laughs> um, so like I say, the rest of this class is not speculation about life on the other side of the grave. Uh, but whenever I talk about the aging process as it leads to death, it is with the conviction that there is more. Uh, and that just as this whole arc is good and of God, so the whole cycle is good and of God, and there is more to come. Any thoughts or questions, contributions there? All right. So we've got the first half of life. We've got the second half of life. And right in the middle is, is what? Middle age. That's right. <laughs> and so... Uh, middle age in our culture uh, is generally understood as starting around 40. There's no definite start date or no definite end date, but roughly it begins at around age 40, which is interesting if you're at all biblically literate because 40 is a term that shows up all over the Bible. Uh, it rained 40 days and 40 nights. Uh, Jesus fasted for 40 days. The Israelites wandered in the wilderness for 40 days. Scripturally, whenever 40 is used, it's used to say a sufficient amount of time has passed in order to move on to the next thing. So be it 40 days or 40 years, whatever needed to happen during that time has happened, and we can now transition into the next stage. And so in our human development, 40 seems to be this pretty pivotal turning point. Um, I think of my 40th birthday, I actually remember it quite clearly. I was lying in bed, and I'm not going to confess my sins to all of you, particularly since it's online for all posterity to see. But like all of you, we all have our private sins that are our best friends, <laughs> the one we turn to most readily uh, whenever we're stressed or afraid, um, be it alcohol or whatever. So we all have them. I have my own. And I remember at 40 thinking, I'm tired of you. Now, it's not to say I stopped struggling with that sin at that point, but it was a marked shift for me. There was just this sense of, I no longer trust you, I don't like you, and I'd rather you weren't in my life, and I just don't believe you as much. Now, as it is for all of us with our pet sins, whenever we're doing badly enough, we will go right back to our coping mechanisms. It doesn't matter how old we get. Uh, but it is interesting to me that at 40, at the beginning of middle age, there was just this intuitive sense of, I'm done with you. Um, so part of what happens in middle age is you begin to ac accept the particularities of your life. You'll remember we were saying at that early stage when everything is possible, I could have any job. I could be any husband. Uh, I could have any wife, any children. I could live anywhere in the world. Uh, and around middle age, you start to realize all that endless possibility is no longer true. I'm a priest, married to Cynthia, with Henry and Catherine, and I live in Washington. Now I could get divorced and have a second wife, and I could get another church. I could change jobs. But by and large, all that potential has narrowed down to the actual particularities of who you became. Um, and my suspicion is that the stereotypical midlife crisis, you know, the, the man who divorces his wife and marries the trophy wife or uh, gets a sports car or something like that, I don't think the real issue is that you're trying to become young again. I think what you're trying to do is to experience afresh the excitement and energy we felt of that boundless potential. That season of life was delicious in its way when anything could be, and you hit your 40s and into your 50s, and none of that potential exists in the same way anymore, I think that midlife crisis is, I just want to feel that way again when everything's open. That's just my own theory. So um, in midlife, what can happen for us? We start to um, identify the particularity of our lives and to live more peaceably within its limitations. Um, now, some of those limitations are sorrowful things. Um, the older we get, the more bereavements we have. I've got a particular theory that one of the uh, 
real difficulties uh, as we get, especially as we get very old, is we carry a weight of an enormous number of bereavements. All those people we have known and loved and whose existence was so central to our own. You know, we know ourselves largely in relationship. And when those relationships start being removed from us, there, it is a weight that doesn't lessen. You learn to live with it. Um, but part of the limitations of our increasing years is carrying those increasing bereavements. Um, there is also the limitations of all those things not obtained. I dreamed I would become a PhD professor and da 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 da, and I could do it. But I didn't, and I'm now not going to. That's a sorrow, because it was part of that vision of the life you were going to have, and you didn't. And there's a kind of grieving that happens for things that never became, as well as things that were lost. Uh, be it a spouse, be it your childhood home that got sold and then turned into three apartments and it looks like crap. You know, like these things that are lost, they're legitimate losses. And part of the limitation of the second half of life is living with the reality of those losses in our lives. Uh, then, of course, there's the chronic pain. I haven't entered this yet. I've never had chronic pain. Uh, but many of you are living with chronic pain. Um, and some of you are living with terminal pain. It's not just something you're gonna have for the rest of your life, but you know it's the thing that's gonna kill you. Um, when life includes the limitations that are imposed by chronic pain, that's real. And the structure of your life is now partly formed by those limitations. Um, and we can resist it, we could be angry at it, we could feel hard done by it, but I think the path of wisdom is admitting these are the limitations of my life. Um, and I am called with God to live within the reality of who I am now. Um, but again, I don't wanna be at all a downer here. Part of the limitations also means beginning to stride in confidence for your particular giftedness. Um, you're not going to be all things, like we used the Gale example earlier. Um, if you're not a particularly friendly person, it's probably not going to happen at 80. <laughs> you're, you're not going to become like that, most likely. Um, but part of aging is when you start to recognize, but this is what I am. Um, and this is what I have to give, particularly. Um, I remember when I was in grad school, uh, I said I uh, stopped being a smart kid in high school. That's not entirely true. I still had a remnant of, I'm pretty smart. Um, but when I got to grad school, the gulf between me and the smartest students got massively bigger. <laughs> I was at a pretty good school with a crackerjack faculty, and people came from around the world to study under them. And I just remember that first fall thinking, I don't know what's going on. <laughs> like, I read the book and I didn't understand it, and now we're talking about it in class, and all these other students are asking clearly intelligent questions based on the fact that they understood the lecture or understood the book, and I don't. And it was a moment of panic for me, and I could picture exactly where I was when I had this clarity of, they are not your competitors. You do not need to be jealous of them. The truth is, they are better theological students than you are. And that is not a thing to be ashamed of. It's just true. Um, but it wasn't just, OK, so you're not as good as them. It was a recognition, I am not in competition with them because they are going to use their skills and giftedness uh, to bless the church to which I belong. They're going to become the next generation of PhDs. They're going to become the next generation of seminary professors. They're going to be the ones who are helped shaping the dialogue for the next generation of the church making sense of this world we're living in. Uh, you belong to that church, and you belong to them. So everything that they're excelling in is not a statement of what you're not good at. Um, you are being blessed by it as well because you are one. And we'll get to that more of that later. Uh, but it was a breakthrough for me, and I think it's true for many people, um, that part of living in limitations 
is recognizing I'm not particularly good at that and I don't need to be. I am good at that and I do need to do this because it is what I am called to give to this world. And those other people who are good at those things are not my competitors, but each of us are contributing in our way to the whole of who we are as a people, be that as a church, uh, be that as a society, be that as a species, um, that all of us have our particular strengths, we all contribute what we have, and we are all blessed by it as one. Um, and part of limitations as well is a recognition that I don't have to become good at things that are not true of me. I think some of us have this idea uh, that my goal of where I'm shooting for in this life is I have to overcome all those flaws and omissions uh, in my life. And I remember visiting one elderly woman uh, in our church. Uh, she was never known to the congregation because she lived in a retirement home the whole time she was a member here. But she had been an English professor um, at a university, and she was a brilliant woman. And I was sitting in her apartment, and her desk was a disaster. And I asked, what do you want? She said, oh, I've just got to get that desk cleaned off. And I said, have you ever had a clean desk? <laughs> you know, she was a professor. Have you ever had a clean desk? And she looked at me with this sparkle in her eye and went, I said, maybe you need to let that one go. <laughs> you know, like, you felt guilty, like you're some kind of inferior human your whole professional career because of your messy desk. So what? You're not good at keeping a clean desk. It's just a personality issue. <laughs> it's not a moral issue. Uh, and I think there's kind of a freedom of living into the limitations of saying, I'm not a clean desk person. That's it. Um, but also part of that kind of acceptance of your limitations is recognizing um, the way it affects other people. You know, it could be carrying on with the messy desk analogy. On that messy desk are all your insurance papers, it's your bills that haven't been paid, you're getting increasingly confused by it, your ch adult children are showing up and they're getting angry at you. It's kind of flippant to say, I'll never have a clean desk, you know, let's have another martini. You know, like, <laughs> part of recon recognizing limitations, say, sometimes my limitations or weaknesses are actually a problem for other people. I'm at a point now where I realize I'm not going to be able to make it easier for them, um, but nor do I need to be flippant or defensive or judgmental or any of those behaviors that are really defensive behavior trying to hide your shame. It's just a recognition, oh, John, I'm sorry. I know my desk is a mess. I know this is going to be your problem. I wish it were otherwise. Um, but at this stage of my life, I do not believe I'm ever going to get a clean desk. How much easier to be in relationship when that's the posture you enter with? You're just naming it. You're not being judgment or defensive or protective. You just name it and say, I'm sorry. Um, there's such a, um, a graciousness in that, not only for the one you're in relationship with, uh, but also for yourself. Um, any thoughts on limitations and living in that? This is a bit of a tangent, but I remember... Oh, wait, you're about to get a microphone for the sake of our online community, Gail. But you've got to get it in your mouth. Uh, this is a bit of a tangent, but I remember... Uh, I grew up in a home where there were four kids in five years, so it was pretty hard to keep that house neat. And I always wanted it to be neat. And I remember, and I'd come home from college and clean closets. Yeah. And I remember getting to an age, say, early 20s or something, and it dawned on me, this house is only going to be the way you want it when, when your folks are gone. So that was kind of the first aha. Uh -huh. I didn't want them gone, right? And so letting that go, and then realizing a few years later, all the extended family liked to come to our house because my mother was relaxed. And so the very thing that as a child I had wanted to change and see as a limitation, it, there was a hospitality there that everybody responded to. So it was different, different stages of my life having to let go different things and the wisdom emerging as 
as that kind of happened. I think that's a great example because part of when we are in the first half of life in that kind of ego stage of our life, not only do we want what we want, we just naturally assume that what we want is the only good truth. <laughs> because you just haven't learned that there are other people who function differently, who have different personalities, who have different gifts and skills and desires. So if you want a clean house, um, everyone would benefit from a clean house um, until you realize that maybe others don't want what you want. <laughs> Jeff. One of those things that I've learned very recently is to accept my own limitations and to take good care of my life. Prayer was the best organization for me I've ever seen in my life. It's also my first church in my life. Yeah. You don't want me to. <laughs> Yeah. 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 I think that's a good point. Um, that you're recognizing one another's limitations as well and one another's gifts and strengths. And again, that's that whole part of in the second half of life as you're growing a greater consciousness that I am we, that I have a corporate identity as well. And that corporate identity uh, includes what other people um, are contributing to the whole. Yeah. Yeah. All right, well, that brings me um, to the next, the final main point I want for today's lecture, and that is on this whole concept of our unity and our enlarging sense of being a larger body of people. Um, and when I say that, it is not just a club we belong to. Uh, the technical term is an ontological reality, which means who we are in our essence is not only individual, uh, that we really are corporate. Um, and I think most wisdom and faith traditions all end up in this same place of recognizing like this true sense of beingness um, actually is corporate. Um, so for us coming from a Christian tradition, uh, there are a couple ways uh, we have named that. Uh, the first is who we claim God to be and the theology we use of God in our tradition is Trinity. This very idea that God is at once three, the Father, the Son, the Spirit, uh, and one. That the very nature of the Godhead is a community of particulars who are utterly also one. And too often in the church we dismiss Trinity as just a formula for a riddle we can't understand because the Bible says there's a Father, a Son, and a Spirit, so we just throw it all together and call it a Trinity. It's so much more than that. The concept of Trinity is this idea that multiples can be one. Um, and if that's who God is, and we are made in the image of God, as our tradition says, then it means uh, that we too share this thing of, I am both Eric, and I am Eric and Jeff, and I am Eric and Jeff and Paul, and that my Jeff Paul Ericness is no less real than my Ericness. Um, and one way of understanding what this means to be a broken world is this idea that we only believe the individual and we don't believe the corporate. And what the life of faith and ongoing formation is doing, it's bringing us to that place where we could enter more and more fully into this corporate reality. Uh, I know again for myself, when I am in my most mystical place of faith, um, it always is ushering me into that greater sense of I do not exist apart from my oneness with everything. Not only all other humans, but God and the rest of creation. Um, another metaphor we use in the, our faith tradition is that of the body of Christ. Paul explores this theology all the time that as the church, we are the body of Christ, um, that we, our whole true self is together. Um, and then you think about Jesus uh, in John at the Last Supper. He has this long prayer and he weaves in and out of this language where he's praying for the disciples. Father, I pray that they may be one as you and I are one and I am in you and you are in me so, they, so may they be in me and me in them so that it just weaves around and around like that is his final prayer is let my disciples experience their existence as you and I experience it as totally one. Um, 
as we start growing into a greater sensibility about this shared existence, um, it becomes so much easier and more natural to want to love each other. You know, like, to, I want to give my gifts, uh, be it money or time or attentiveness or just the gift of my spirit and care. If I am one with you, of course I want your good. When it comes to forgiveness, once you kind of enter in this different way of thinking, forgiveness is actually really easy. How could I want anything but your good, you and I who are one? Um, in blessing your enemies, if you're starting to enter into a deeper reality that though that behavior may be diabolical, may, though that behavior may be detestable to me, I actually believe that you and I are one, and I only want your good. Um, this is some deep spirituality, and just because I say I sometimes enter into that perception in mystical moments, this isn't to say I dwell in it all the time, uh, but it's the orientation uh, towards which a maturing spirituality tends to take us. Um, and one way I'd like, uh, oh, getting back to the Trinity, um, perhaps one of the ways we can most access that mystery is in marriage itself. You know, it's no accident that the scriptures and therefore our marriage vows in the church use this language uh, that the two shall become one flesh. Um, and if we think about the yearnings we had as a single person for marriage, um, there's so much we want in that marriage. We want the stability of a home, we want children, and we, you know, we want a cute dining table. Um, but beneath that, what we want, the yearning is, I want to be fully known and to fully know. I want to be fully loved and to love fully. And what we seek in that is just this absolute sense of oneness. Uh, and uh, I think it becomes a metaphor or a lived sacrament, if you will, of uh, what we believe to be true of who God is and our yearning for God himself. Uh, that we are seeking that kind of oneness, such as we have known in our yearnings for a spouse. Uh, but of course, no marriage is that good, <laughs> right? They don't reach that kind of existential oneness, but we know the desire that that relationship uh, taps into. Um, which brings me, I want to talk about love as kind of a case study uh, for what we mean by oneness. Um, I want to talk about being in love versus loving uh, and pair those two phrases in that first half, second half of life motif I introduced at the beginning. Being in love is very much a first half of life impulse. You know, when, when we're, it's intense, right? Like we want to be consumed with that kind of passion that can't get enough of each other, that wants to be kissing the whole time, having sex the whole time, or in earnest conversation the whole time. Like, we just want that intensity. Um, it is, by and large, a very self-centered phenomena. I mean, obviously, it involves the one other partner, but it is just about you and finding your place in this intense union. I suspect that what's at the heart of it, apart from all the chemicals that are just surging through your body, demanding release, um, at a psychological level, we want something that validates our existence uh, and our desirability. In order to, be convin to convince ourselves that we have worth, we want someone else to intensely desire us and tell us, you are desirable, you are seen, you are loved, you are belong in this place. Um, the fact that we actually crave physical connection um, is telling to me. Um, I, so there's a very kind of inward-focused, intense desire to validate your worth. Um, probably it has tied into it your differentiation from your family of origin. You know, it is natural. Nature is requiring you to separate from your family of origin, which means you want to find a new place, <laughs> a new relationship that will give you that security. Um, and it gives you some sense of hope for the future. You know, if that kind of driving agenda in the first half of life is, will I have a secure place in the future? And we're looking for all manner of things to, to secure it. Um, kind of that intense being in love experience is giving us reason to hope that I will have that security. 
But the second half of life, it isn't to say that there aren't intense moments of loving, um, but I think it's a much more a broader season of I love as God loves. Uh, and this more mature love, it's less about that self-gratification that's driving the being in love. Loving is far more genuinely other-focused, which really is the heart of love, that I desire your good. Um, and it could be people you are in relationship with. Um, it, it, it could be the church in general. It could be humanity. It can be creation. Like there's a sense you're shifting more towards, I simply desire the good of the other, which surely is what we attribute to the divine intent uh, of a perpetual desire for our wholeness. Um, so this kind of second half of life love, um, it's far more mellow. <laughs> it's far more peaceable. Um, it's genuinely other-centered. Uh, and you do want to give yourself to it. No longer with such a drive for what security I, am I going to get out of it, but it's like, oh, look, I can care for you. I, I heard a description of what cloistered nuns are doing. <laughs> they remove themselves from the world entirely and shut the door behind them and enter into love for the world. You know, when they have their prayer, you know, nine times a day or whatever, the basic thrust of that time is they are loving God and they are interceding for the world. These cloistered nuns are paying a lot of attention to the daily news. <laughs> uh, be, and they are loving the world in this deeply profound way that has nothing to do about what am I getting out of it. It's just they've shifted into this space. I now love. Um, and so that brings us to the end of our time. Uh, we have five minutes. Uh, <laughs> what I'm going to invite you to do, um, if you are at home, do what you want with this time. Mm. Um, if you're here, I invite you uh, to turn to one another, just break up into twos. Uh, my question for you to discuss is getting back to that question about coping mechanisms. As willing and as vulnerable as you are willing to be, it's to talk with one another about what coping mechanisms from the first half of your life have you been able to recognize as no longer your friends? And you could take as many minutes as you need, Waters. Uh, what coping mechanisms are no longer your friends? Um, and what awareness do you have of what has replaced that? Uh, and it could be the answer is, oh, I don't know, and you, you listen to your partner. And if neither of you know and you don't even feel like exploring it, talk about whatever topic in this lecture uh, <laughs> appealed to you, and uh, that's your topic of conversation. And, um, just talk as long as you want to. Um, we're four minutes to two. Uh, this ends the lecture proper, uh, and I will give you, inst you will get instructions from the church about are we meeting in this same format next week? Um, no lunch, upstairs, masks. Um, we'll let you know as we monitor what's going on. All right? So Pete, thank you for videoing this. Goodbye to our online friends, and uh, you know where the bathrooms are.